Hello, my name is Colin Joyce. Um, I'm a fellow with the Contemplative Study Centre. I'd like to welcome you to this Tradition Deep Dive hosted by the Contemplative Study Centre at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, country, but I'm in uh, Kakadu at the moment, so I'm with the um, Namira people. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of where I am, but also like to acknowledge the Wandjeri people who are the traditional owners of um, most of the uh, what the area down in Melbourne, where most people are, who are the traditional custodians of the land there. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and of uh, the Kulin Nation, and extend my respect to all Indigenous Australians present. So, today we are joined by Dr. May Ward, who works to foster an ethical connection to a place grounded in embodied intuitive and intellectual understanding of the animate world. She has learned from Aboriginal teachers around Australia and is committed to amplifying their voices and integrating their wisdom into her teaching of writing, dance and acknowledging country. The PhD in creative writing was an investigation of somatic and shamanistic metaphysics. Today, Maya will present an embodied exploration of the animist tradition of Europe and contemporary ecological or pattern thinking. This experiential workshop incorporates embodied writing exercises to evoke a felt sense of, of the depth mode of perception of the natural world. The workshop is designed to be interactive, but please note that it is being recorded. So if you prefer to keep your camera or microphone off, you're welcome to post, uh, you're, you know, please do. You're also welcome to post questions and comments in the chat. So welcome, Maya. Good to see you. Great to be here, Cullen. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for coming along. I um, thank you, Cullen, for um, acknowledging country on the behalf of us all. And I too would like to acknowledge that I am here on Wurundjeri country. <sighs> it's a big thing. It's a big thing we're involved in right now in this culture. Suddenly all over the country, we are starting to change our ways and take some responsibility for our history. This new, really new ritual for settler culture of acknowledging where we are acknowledging who, where we are and by doing that, acknowledging in, in part what we've done it's really complex because it's really hard. It's actually quite painful. So we acknowledge country and so often we just quickly do it and then get down to business. I am so interested in what happens when we slow that down and when we let what we've just said, I acknowledge country ancient, living, cultural landscape, tens of thousands of years old. I acknowledge that the land here, the land that I love and cherish was, is stolen land, unceded land, belonging to another nation, and that right now we are here. Ill-gotten means. All of that is a fascinating, painful, but ultimately profoundly full of potential for us as a nation and for us as individuals. I was in Darwin last year. And I've I tell this story a bit in my Acknowledging Country courses because I was so struck by this event I was at. It was, um, it was actually a drag show, a really big outdoor drag show as part of the Darwin Festival. And in that, uh, we had a wonderful um, MC, Fez Fa'ana, and um, she um, acknowledged country and she said something. Okay, everybody, unclench your buttocks. What she did was acknowledge that we have bodies and that these bodies 
are reacting to this new ritual that in so many ways we're still uncomfortable with because we are living in a state of profound difficulty, difficulty with our history. She pointed to the fact that our bodies might be registering that when we ourselves are not allowing ourselves to think about it. So that really gave me pause. I thought, like, okay, body, body, what are we holding? What are we holding? And I, I begin like this because I wish to say that, you know, this deep dive that I've been invited to give tonight, today, um, which I have to say I'm very, I'm rather daunted, very pleased and somewhat overwhelmed with this responsibility because my deep dive is a very, very circular path. It, I would agree that it has been a deep dive. But it, what, is, what is it that I have dived into is um, perhaps not so clear. I'll tell you a story to background what I'm saying. It was 19 years ago and I set out one um, beautiful April morning with three friends to walk the length of the main Wurundjeri song line as it traverses through the entire length of the city that I was born in, the city my parents, my grandparents and great grandparents were born in, the city of Melbourne. But I, that day, and for the, all that, that full day and for the every day for the next three weeks, I invited myself to to enter a different kind of reality from the, from the city that I'd grown up in, that I lived in, because I was walking a song line, a 60,000 year old ancient dreaming track, a cultural repository of the, the wisdom, the accumulated wisdom of peoples who had learned to come into a very precise, very exact, non-extractive, permanent culture in this land. An extraordinary achievement. That walk, that pilgrimage as we called it, we started in, in Williamstown at the sea and uh, a Wurundjeri woman, Tammy Kapoki, was there. And she asked that the spirits of the ancestors walk with us. And I set out. And as I walked, it was the strangest thing. It was, quite simply, the strangest experience of my life. Because there was a sense, somehow, of a kind of singing in the background very deeply moving, deeply affecting, humbling sense of music as I walked. Walking all day, every day across the land, having to have had, we, we had to send out hundreds of letters to get permission to walk by the river because this land that only, we set out in 2003 and it was only in 1903 that William Barrack, the headman of the Wurundjeri, who was there as a boy when Batman came to their country. He died only 100 years between his passing and our setting out. A tiny, tiny little moment in the history of this place. So to walk with that incredible gift, may the spirits of the ancestors walk with you. To walk knowing the depth of history, knowing my own attachment to this land, but knowing how tenuous and yet how 
incredibly effaced, incredibly transformed had this land been. So it was, it was setting out with excitement and joy and the physical pleasure of adventure, as well as great grief and great discomfort. Quite the most complex experience of my life. And I'd traveled around the world. I'd been on long walks before, but there was nothing, nothing, nothing like this. And getting to the source after three weeks was an experience that completely turned me inside out. And I came back home and I found if I ever tried to speak about it, my whole body would start shaking and I would feel overwhelmed. I tell this experience because I have been thinking about this event for the last 19 years because it's been so such an interesting thing to think about and such a difficult experience to integrate. Because when I started shaking, I didn't know why I was shaking. What was going on was my question. And so I set out, I, 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 spent, <laughs> I spent seven years and I wrote a book about my experience because when I got to the source, it's such a clear, sense in me that I had to share this story. I had to share how getting what felt to me like the tiniest, tiniest glimpse of what lay still deep in this land it was such a shatteringly powerful experience that I had to say thank you. I had to share it. And, you know, to be able to, with permission from Warren elders, share their stories was such a privilege. It was very difficult, though. And I got to the end and I wrote that book and I finished it and I knew that I still didn't understand it. I still had no idea of what happened. So then I began a PhD. And my question that I asked in this PhD was, what is going on in my body? Why do I start shaking? Not only when I start talking about it, well, that's, that's settled. But then when I started writing and when I got to what felt like something like truth, I'd start shaking again. And then I would feel like I'm not writing. And then something would come through and something beautiful would arrive on the page. And then one of my um, good friends and mentors went through the book with me and he said, I love all of these bits most. And I said, ah, they're all the bits I didn't write. I was very clear about that. I wasn't responsible for those bits. They were the, they were the times when I felt like my body was taken over by something bigger and wilder and stranger and stronger than me, wiser, wiser than me. So my question for my PhD is, what's going on? What is this? So it became a kind of um, neuroscience and philosophy and theology and anthropology and poetics mishmash of a PhD, which luckily, because I was doing it in creative writing, I could completely justify. They couldn't tell me I was doing it wrong because it was all in the grist for the mill for creative writing. So after three and a half years, my supervisor said, you've done it. This is great. And I said, no, I still don't understand. A year and a half later, after five years, I went, I think I get it now. I think I understand. I was wrong, but I was happy enough to put the PhD in. It's another four years. I really feel like I'm onto something now. But I could be wrong. A tradition deep dive. Should I return to that? The deep dive was quite unexpected for me, for me, unexpectedly for me, into what I think I now call Neoplatonism. A philosophical tradition that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years in the Western tradition that helped me understand why I felt like I had what I now understand wrongly to be an 
Aboriginal experience, because at that time when I didn't have any philosophical training and I had an experience of what I knew to be a song line, not that I could understand what that meant, I felt like I had had an, an experience of what Aboriginal people were speaking of. I now know that's not the case, but because I didn't have an education, I couldn't work it out. I hope this is, I hope I'm explaining this clearly because this is, I'm trying to synthesize and collapse to 19 years of full-time research. <laughs> to say that I discovered through the help of neuroscience and somatics, because in this time, I was going through enormous problems with chronic pain. And part of what I did to manage that was getting into dance. And I, re I dived as deeply into dance as I did into philosophy. Dance, but not dance as in learning steps, dance as in the inner feeling of my body and the great feeling inside my body when I danced. And that was the key for helping me understand philosophy as I think it is meant to be understood. So we live in interesting times. When we're in trouble and anyone who is paying attention knows this. We are staring down the barrel of climate change, resource depletions, species extinction. And if we are not afraid and grieving and feeling ashamed and confused and brokenhearted, then we're probably not in our bodies. We're probably dissociated, taking our attention and awareness out of our bodies because it's too painful. Because it is, it's too painful. We don't have, we've never as a species, never as a planet had a moment like this. It's really hard. So most of us on some level, sometimes all of the time, sometimes part of the time, we're not really here. which is a good coping strategy. There's nothing innately wrong with it. I'm not trying to in any way shame us further. I'm just pointing out that it's hard. How to make sense then. So my journey really was to understand try to seek to understand how Western philosophy which started off like, like most shamanic traditions, deep, transformative, spiritual unfolding and profound connection between the body and the world. Socrates, Plato's great teacher said, the essence of wisdom is to experience the forms, Plato's forms, this foundation of Western philosophy in this world. But what happened? Plato's ideas of the forms, the other perfect world, was taken by, among other traditions, Christianity. It's like, there's another world, but it's not here. It's the perfect world. It's not here. It's this place called heaven. We can't get there from here. You can't get there if you're not in your body. That is really the nub of things because we have Socrates saying, find it here, find it now, find it inside the innerness of things. And the only way to deeply experience innerness is by, by having the capacity to access the intelligence, the wisdom of the flesh. 
Disembodied culture can't do that. So we're at a really interesting time where we've got neuroscience and we've got an amazingly vibrant emerging field of somatic research, body research, saying, what is your felt experience? We also are at a time where we have a lot of emerging trauma theory about how to, how to unlock the, the emptiness by, so depression, for instance, is not necessarily a disease of grief. It's a disease of not feeling, blankness, emptiness. Grief and depression are not the same thing. They're quite a long way away from each other. Depression is a, a kind of sadness that is a stuckness. But when we have difficult situations where we don't want to feel, we're all in this sort of realm of stuckness. So anyway, an interesting time that is actually bringing together ancient philosophy and saying, there's a lot of wisdom here, but we haven't been able to understand it for a long time because our culture hasn't understood and appreciated and respected the body. And there's, again, had, I don't, <laughs> collapsing a whole lot of, <laughs> a whole lot of research in a really short time, but we've had some pretty hard millennia lately. We've had the witch burnings and the Inquisition. We've had thousands of years of colonization throughout Europe, wars, almost continuous wars. All of that's had a really, really big formative grounded, grounding, as in, yeah, primary impact on what we experience as our culture. Not necessarily consciously at all, mostly unconsciously. But to understand the deep roots of Western philosophy is to do the work to unlock the body, soothe the emotional pain, and not get rid of it because we can't, but we can be compassionate with it. We can be kind with it, playful with it, and alive to it. At this, in, at this moment, I've been nattering for quite a long time. I would really like to invite you all to get up, if you would, and shake. Get some very deep breaths. You don't have to, but if you want to, I'd like you just to reach up, stretch, reach your fingers to the sky, toes to the earth, and breathe in. Make a bit of a noise as you breathe out. Bit of a shake, bit of a jiggle. Breathe in to what I've been speaking about and release and shake. One more, big, big breath. Feel how that air is going into every single cell of your body and waking it up alive and tingling. Feel that tingle all the way to your skin and make a sigh on the way out. Give a jiggle. And note how you feel now. Do you feel different? Let's check in with yourself. Yes. So. I would like to invite you now, before I speak anymore, to do an exercise. So this workshop is, um, as you, if you read the, in, read the write up, um, about, um, yeah, it's a dive into through, through seeking to give you an, some, some of the, some tastes of the experience of what I'm talking about. And I'm going to give, I'm, I'm going to speak more about what, what we're doing after, but I want to try and give you a bit more of an unmediated experience, if you like. So if you have pen and paper handy, that would be wonderful. If you just have your 
your computer, you could just, you know, open a Word document or something and type up there. But um, pen and paper is good. I am, um, what we're going to do um, is I will take you through a guided writing, a guided medita medita meditation experience. It won't last for more than a couple of minutes, if that. And then I'm going to ask you to write, but not necessarily in the way you've written before. This is called um, automatic writing. And um, you are, I will ask you a question and the answer will come through your pen. There's, there's two rules. Don't stop or edit. Just keep going. And if you get stuck, you don't know what's to come next, just write the same word or the last word over and over and over and over and over until you're freed again. Writing fast and writing unedited will enable something else to come to the fore. I'll talk a bit about that at the later. But I just want, to, want you to have, seek to give you an experience of this. So are you... And what we'll do, we will do that and yeah, do that exercise and then I'll give you further instructions. So um, I um, would invite you now to get comfortable. Feel free to turn off your screen if you wish. You don't need to. But just um, get comfortable. Perhaps close your eyes. A few more bit deep breaths. and sink into your chair or your the ground wherever it is you are big breath and a release and the invitation to you is to imagine yourself very very young and in a wild or a natural place that you loved, a place you knew as a child. It could be a place you visited many times, like your garden. It could be a place you visited once and made an impression. Recall that place from when you were as young as possible and land there and look around you. What is it that you see? What is it that you smell? What is it that you are touching? What is it that you are feeling here and hearing? And feel into your love for this place. And now, in a moment, you're going to write, but you actually. I'm not going to write. The invitation now is to ask for the experience of the place. Imagine now that place, that place that you love, seeing you, hearing you, feeling you. What is it like for this place to feel your love? The invitation is to find out about the place's experience by letting the place pick up your pen 
and write about its experience. So do that now. Pick up your pen and let the place tell you about its experience of your, of you and your love. Off you go. Okay, everyone, I invite you to finish up and to turn back your, turn on your screens again, if you will. I would like to suggest that you don't know what's on your page yet, because perhaps you didn't write it. So now I'd like to invite you into an experience of discovering what is on your page. And the way I would I'd like to offer to do that is for you to pair up with one other person on this call in a breakout room. I understand that what you've written on the page might feel really personal, but I've done this many, many, many times now. And I think I'd love you to trust this process. Trust that everyone here is a beautiful human with a strong and rich experience of place. And the invitation is for you to come together and share your experience by reading it. If you really, really don't want to, that's fine. Perhaps you could speak about your experience, but everyone who ever does is surprised and delighted. Welcome back, everybody. I'd like to read you a poem now. This is a poem, possibly one of the oldest in the Celtic tradition, a place which, given the looks of us, many of us have ancestral ties to. A song written down at least 2,000 years ago, but considered to be from uh, preserved through oral traditions for a few thousand years before that. Um, from uh, originally translated from the Gaelic. It's called The Song of Amergen. I am the stag of the seven times. I am the bull of the seven battles. I am the boar of the seven bristles. I am the flood cresting plains. I am the wind sweeping deep waters. I am the swift swimming salmon in the shallow pool. I am the sunlit dewdrop. I am the fairest of flowers and I am the crystalline fountain. I am the, the hawk shrieking after its prey. I am the demon ablaze in the campfire ashes. I am the battle hardened spearhead. I am the veil echoing voices. I am the sea's roar. I am the surging sea wave. I am the summit of art. I am the God who inspires your desires. I and the hope of heaven. Who else knows the ages of the moon? Who else knows where the sunset settles? Who else knows the secret of the unhewn dolmen? Now there's many theories as to that poem. But being from so long ago, we can only speculate. I find it beautiful and evocative. But now I'm going to ask you to go through another process with your words before we chat together. 
this time you're going to be um, placed in um, Zoom groups of four. And again, if um, I think there's one group of four and one group of two. So um, I think we can just, the group of four can look after themselves. Group of two, if you could join and we can make it work. And um, this time, the invitation is to read it aloud again, not as it is. This time, I'd like you to go around, you write, read out one line of your list and then the next person and just work out between you. Go around in a, <laughs> in a in, go around the circle of boxes, if you will. And each time, just one of yours with the words, we are in front of it. And so your poem becomes joined collectively. It's a, it's a creative act between you. And I'd like to offer this. When you're speaking aloud, how you speak matters. So I would invite you to speak beautifully, slowly, carefully, honourably, because you are speaking of things you love. And you're coming into presence with those words when you speak them aloud. So I'm going to ask Daniel if he could please put everyone in groups of four. Welcome back, everybody. Well, again, I would love to invite um, anyone to um, speak a little of their experience um, of that shared encounter and, and also the I am, the I am and the, and the transition from I am to we are. If anyone has any, anything to share, it would be really beautiful to hear from you. And you can just put the um, in the reactions, you go to reactions and there is the um, raise hand function like that. Um, the reading out the I am's, what it did very strongly for me was embody the feeling. So it wasn't just a, an intellectual um, um, exercise it was it, it became cellular um, and it became connecting to to the experience so there was no distance between my my thinking of it and the experience of it that was and likewise listening to the sharing it was it made the other person's sharing much more. It made it accessible on, on that sort of physical way. And then when we read the We Are, for me, it became very celebratory. Like, a, it became like a, a song and a dance together. And again, with that embodiment and that celebration of all that. That's so beautiful. Thank you, Noni. Yes, I, 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 think, I think of it like a praise song, you know, um, which is, uh, you know, um, one of my favourite philosophers, um, Robert Bringhurst, speaks that language, I wish I could remember, oh, can I remember the quote? Language is, for, is not for talking about the world. That's for dilettantes, for amateurs. Language is for talking with the world. So when you direct the attention from yourself outward and into a kind of collective, something can happen. You know, I, I entitled this, this talk, you know, Animism, Embodiment and Belonging. Animism is the lived experience of aliveness, not just in the human thing and not just in, you know, puppies <laughs> but in everything and uh, and but to experience that is actually a practice and that 
practice is is a very ancient one deep listening you know and um uh, Miriam Rose Ungerman Bowman has become rightly well known, I think, in Australia for her work on deep listening, Dadiri, because it's it's just bringing back some something so important and essential for all humans and very deeply part of all traditions. Deep listening, because you're never going to hear the world unless you listen, because the world doesn't speak English. It speaks, but not as we do. And I think it's real, again, I find sort of the science of somatics really helpful here. You know, something like a million bits of information come to us um, every few seconds. And of, the, of those million bits, they say something like 13 of them are processed by the conscious mind. Now, I don't know how they do the maths on that, but what it's saying is that we are almost entirely unconscious. Unconscious means we are body, but information comes to us. It comes to us. We can feel things in our hearts, in our guts, in our skin, in the hairs raising on the back of our necks that we don't understand. We have feelings of them. How we tune in to those feelings and how we become in, an intelligent interpreter of that and bring it into language is really the essence of all art, all human endeavor. Um, but in this time, when we've become very divorced from nature, and also when we are entering into the Anthropocene, into a time of great fear and grief, we need, the support, the nourishment, and the depth provided to us, gifted to us by the more than human world. Because it's very old, very sturdy. It's in this with us, but it can provide the support and the wisdom that we need to get through what we're going. You know, I think I am one of those people who agree with those who say, you know, the only way through this time might be the emergence of a global eco-religion, you know, a, a return to deep reverence and listening to the earth and experiencing ourselves as part of it. So that's what that exercise that I am and we are sought to give. I'd love it if anyone else had... Um, felt inspired to speak more of their experience speak other than Noni. Thank you, Noni. Fiona, thank you. So it's kind of um, connecting the first exercise and the second. So, um, like, if you don't live where you were born, the sense of, um, or my sense of belonging, I find I share with other migrants, but not so much with people who were born and therefore born here and therefore the shared experiences, uh, the human ones are, are very um, common, but there's a, like it, I have a different history as we all have different histories and, and the histories find their way into who we are and, and, and how, we, how we live in the present or how I live in the present and so, um, there's a sense of loss that is um, that I experience of not being where I was born mm -hmm. and so um, I love this country I love hiking I love being out in nature but there's a part of of who I am that is not here 
Mm. Yes. Yes, there's a poignancy in that, isn't there? Thank you. Eva and Amy. It's Eva that wants to speak. <laughs> um, to yeah, um, you spoke and touched my experience as the child of migrants um, and my dad, I say he migrated badly. He left his heart in his mother country um, and I've never left the town I was born in, you know, here in Australia um, and I suspect it's because I witnessed what it means to have dislocated and, you know, so I think you you spoke well to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Any last comments? Reflections. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, these are these are rich exercises to to work with and to do over and over again. Um, I have done them many times, and I find um, you know practice and. Um, a tradition deep dive. A tradition is something that you practice. And so for me, seeking to um, seeking to explore how animism can become real for me, it um, it's a very it's an ongoing journey. And I don't feel like I'm <laughs> any paragon of it. I'm not very good at it necessarily, but I'm certainly in there for it. I'm in there for it. Um, learning to dialogue with the more than human world through contemplative time, through reaching out with, my, with the fullness of my body, sitting and listening and feeling and reflecting what I hear and speaking, seeking to speak with the world has been a, a profoundly, for me, it's a, a very much a spiritual experience because it's, it's so humbling and enlarging and poignant and strange. It forces me to accommodate mystery. Um, so I think what I'm seeking to do, you know, I, I am not clearly of one tradition. It is, um, you know, when I walked, walked the river, walked Birarang and felt that intensity and immensity. It was, it, and then it's been, it's just been a, a long journey to understand my sort of animalistic birthright. My deep, deep belonging is a, is a, as an organism, as a mammal, as a, um, a part of the earth that just happens to have conscious self-awareness. Um, you know, and animism as a framing is very interesting because diving into it deeply has been very interesting because in the practice of it, there's something, something very curious can happen. And that's that sense of, I see, I feel your aliveness. I'm pointing now <laughs> to um, the Kurangana, the mountains on the south of me here in Warburton. Your aliveness and my aliveness are bound up together. It's not that you are alive in any sense like me, it's that aliveness is. Conscious self-awareness is an artifact of the universe because the human is completely and utterly 
inseparable from everything that has grown her, has made her, made him, made them. It's a process. This thing that I see as me is, is really just, um, where is it? I've been munching on my kiwi fruit um, that I grow just here. I am now constituted differently and more deliciously. Goodness, these are great. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm different now. That world that was out there is in me. Continually, we are interacting, exchanging, becoming each other. Well, kiwi fruit is now having a human experience. Um, I don't know. Um, this human is now having a kiwi experience. We are, we're in it together. And conscious self aware, conscious awareness is much more, one way to understand it is that it is the space between all things. It is air itself, if you want to say it like that. It is, and this is coming back to that deep dive into Plato, because he spoke about the eternal forms, that there are patterns behind this form. So this form, this thing keeps changing, keeps reconstituting, but Maya seems to continue. There's a pattern that's holding me together that, is, that has some permanence. Just as hmm, the macadamia seed here, it's the idea of a tree in here. This Combined with sun, water, earth, air, needs all of them, will become tree. It's an idea. All of the information is in here when combined with all of those things. Together, they make something that I can then eat that imparts my aliveness, my awareness. This does not exist without, say, water. Yeah, we all, we, we've all heard that we're about 70% water, which is a beautiful thing. 70% um, oceans, 30% continents. But actually, that's what by weight, by, by molecule, we're more than 99% water. And every single drop of water was made when supernova in various parts of the galaxy exploded. And all that water has come here by way of comets, meteors, over billions of years, and then has been reconstituted and combined and created into this thing that is now water speaking about itself. Am I much better understood than a bit of a river with a flapping tongue? I'm seriously asking these questions because to do, do so helps shift the perspectives and returns us into the context of the alive universe. Every single little bit of it is in on the game, in on the process of making this bit that can speak back to it. You know, and I'm speaking here about you know, science and ecological process, but I'm also speaking what Hinduism has been speaking about and Buddhism has been speaking about, what Platonic philosophy has been speaking about and also what Indigenous philosophy speaks of, which is it's all alive, it's all listening, it's all hearing. We are only custodians. It's not ours. We're in something something very old, very beautiful, very mysterious. So how do we join it? How do, be we, how do we be with it? How do we breathe and understand that 
each breath is literally a gift of trees and that our out breath is a gift in return and that through each other we create we become together mutual co-arising in the buddhist term into being as Thich Nhat Hanh said It's a body experience, breathing into it, feeling into it, contemplating, surrendering, humbling. And the more we can acknowledge that we live in tricky times and that we're grieving, that we're angry, we're frustrated, maybe not now, but we all go through them, through these things, I think. Numb, I experience a lot of numbness myself. But the more we can surrender to that, the more we can, the more we can release and drop, the more we can let the world in, the more capacity we have for listening. Because if we're stuffed full of pain, it's quite difficult to hear. So I'm a big believer in dancing, moving, exercises and practices that let something else take over. And when I say dancing and moving, I mean you don't know what's going to happen. You watch it. You, you 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 just give your give your legs permission to do what they need to do, and you follow that. It's like saying this part of me, which has as much intelligence and awareness and complexity, almost as this neocortex, is in on it and can guide me. And if I listen to it, I can learn, and by extension from the body into the earth in an unfolding, unfurling process of becoming together. Thank you. We were hoping to <sighs> maybe breathe. Could we breathe together? Maybe settle into your surfaces and breathe so deeply that you feel how the tingle of the air extends all the way out to your skin. How the air carrying oxygen is required for every single cell of your body. Through your breath, your bones are nourished, your blood, your sinew. Get in on that process and say thank you to the air, the gifts of the trees for becoming, for a time, a bit of the cellular life that you are dancing around in. Billions and billions of creatures you are all together, all those cells, all those bacteria. In an act of cooperation of such astonishing complexity, you will never, ever, ever get your head around it. But with your whole body saying thank you to that, there is some way in doing that that you get in on the process. You are loyal to your aliveness and the aliveness that spills out everywhere. Thank you. We've left 
we've left some time for for questions and conversation. Um, it would be beautiful to hear from anyone who has some some thoughts or queries or clarifications or body responses even. What's your body saying to you now? And if you don't want to speak aloud, you could jot something down in the chat. That is also really welcomed. But if you want to sit there in silence, that's also perfect. Eva and Amy, thank you. Hi, Maya. Um, I was thinking about how we, you know, I guess listening and that kind of contemplative space that you and state that you talked about. I guess I'm also really interested in how we listen and hold that presence when we're working. Um, you know, because most of the time we're actually working with the land and we're engaging with it, we're using things, we're we're um, receiving from it in sometimes confronting and painful ways if we if we choose to look at that. So I'm just I'm just interested. I I think um, for me it's like because of my own the way that I frame things because of my background. You know, I think of it as a bit of a class kind of there's a class kind of consciousness that comes there where we think being present with the the earth means to stop and be still you know because someone else is killing our animals and growing our food and <laughs> building our housing so I'm just I'm interested in this idea of um you know yeah contemplation and I and um what I know of you may not very much but what I know of you is that you know, you're you know what I'm saying um and I, I don't mean to be judging or criticizing what you're saying yeah but just how we have that presence and um relationship when we're being very practical one might say as well with I love your question it's so rich and important um yes I, I mean I want to just tell a little story of this wonderful experience I had with one of my friends who's on the screen at the moment Genevieve we um we're doing a course together where we um we we had a day long ritual that involved that was set at my house and it involved being deeply present with all processes of life and i um to be very real with you all i am very interested in dealing with our shit i have a compost toilet that I have to empty and wash out buckets of, all of this kind of messy, stinky business. So we did a ritual that honoured the human newer, the returning of our wastes into practical nourishment for the venti garden that I've got out here where I'm trying to grow food, but the currawongs pretty much get every single thing. But anyway, that's another story. Um, so how to be, how to dig the soil, how to pick up rubbish by the river, how to um, plant food, harvest, take responsibility for what we can. And it's tricky because we live in a profoundly extractive society where it's hard to take responsibility and we have to work really hard to, you know, get in on that process. Because the whole the how whole society is saying, don't take responsibility for your damage. Um, but how to be really deeply present with that is um, very much part of it. And it's not. Um, we did a song on that day when um, that I'm talking about with Genevieve. We we did a song. We made a song, a spontaneous song, where we all when we harvested the garlic together. So we dug up my my garlic patch, made a spontaneous song and brought us in together, into the rhythm, into the body. We laid, laid, we put it all in baskets and then we processed to my human ewer, 
my soil, my beautiful, beautiful soil that is completely good microbes, but no bad bacteria after a year of my, my tending. And we picked up the soil with our hands because it's safe and rich and lovely. And we brought it back to the veggie garden. And we did that with song. And it was, I just, I just was just so overflowing with gratitude for this group of people who were, helped me live how I really dream of living, which is in harmony and in right relationship, in ethical reciprocity with the processes that, that um, support my life. And I had to work really hard to make something that felt congruent, deeply congruent and cultural. But, you know, so because, because everything in us is not aligned that way culturally it's it's so it's work at the moment but by doing ritual by continuing by returning every year to this and it reminds me that you know it was 23 years ago when I started work at Ceres Community Environment Park in my in my job interview I said I want to start a multicultural harvest festival so all these old Maltese and Greek and Italians who are elderly and growing their food can teach you know young inner city people how to do this and and how can we say thank you for them for holding and preserving the old knowledge how can we celebrate that together how can we make song and dance about it so we did we had a whole and that harvest festival is still going at series 23 years later and um there is in that time in the late 90s when it began there was so little culture of local food or of really you know honoring honoring wisdom and you know we, we incorporated in indigenous wisdom indigenous foods as well into that along into the mix and we had a big day of harvesting the food from the series community environment park that used to be a rubbish tip but with hard work has been returned to soil grows food we harvested together we cooked together and we composted together in one big long ritual day so it made me remember that actually i've been doing this doing this for a while but it's still not I can still go to the IGA and get everything I need here in this little village of Orbiton we're playing at the moment for when we really need to and David Hongren the permaculturalist who is always a guest the honor one of the honored guests at every harvest festival and I interviewed him about his work and that's what he said you know we're keeping the seeds alive until we're over this fossil fuel hump of a strangeness and we come back into right relationship if we can from the other side it's a long a long answer i'd love to hear if anyone else has any reflections or questions thank you so much evie did i thanks man i really appreciate it yeah Thank you, Fiona. I play, laughter, taking the piss out of yourself. I'm talking about me here, right? So as a you know, upper middle class British twit, um, one thing we know how to do is to really tear each other to shreds and say how pretentious you are. Like, um, like when you were talking about play, I was thinking actually play is so is so much fun. Play is is you know laughter. Play keeps keeps me going. If I don't laugh, I I I you know there was a wonderful um, comment on the chat about the suffering, like connection brings suffering. And I, I, I wholeheartedly agree, like, you know, you just see a tree cut down or you just watch the news, anything. And, but you can't, like the laughter and the joy and the play is, is also part of what, what makes life meaningful. I guess I guess it's 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 the meaningful part of it, and that that um, 
seriousness gets us so far and then we just gotta at least I just have to do something completely stupid or laugh or you know make a fool of myself you know like that. one thing I'm I don't think we're often very good at is making a fool of ourselves <laughs> I just oh, thank you so much, Fiona. Such a beautiful, rich, rich thought. I mean, because it's you're absolutely right. I mean that that ritual day, that serious day, of, with our hands, a clump of ex poo, you know, former poo, down to the gut, down to the gut. We were laughing the whole time while also serious. You know, it was holy, sacred play. You know, and um, that's trickster trickster is a very old god utterly essential and completely present in every pagan culture that i know of because yeah we've got to keep laughing at ourselves and you know as bb colin you you said you know your 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 comment it's like we can't do this kind of work of feeling more unless we come into community and unless we support each other I, and I'm this is probably the most serious and important thing I could say is that we can't do this work alone anymore because it's too hard it's too heavy um, we've got to work out how to make more cultural forms more ritual forms of being together with this stuff um, grieving together, praising together, playing together, being creative together. Because when we grieve, we give, we create so much more space for new possibilities. It's a, it's a real thing. You feel better after you've cried and you feel more hopeful and more possible. There's more possibility. So, yeah, thank you. I, um, I mean, it's, it's become very important to me and after a long time of doing it, everything backward, you know, doing a PhD alone is one of the most stupid human pursuits imaginable. You know, it's got to be done in community and that's really where I've turned my attention and I'm really, really loving running courses now and um, Bronwyn is here from, from a group that um, I facilitate called the Co-Becoming Practice Community and it's very much about... How do we come together in this kind of practice? So I'd really, um, I'd love to keep in touch with anyone who's interested in this work. I have my website, which I think was on the Melbourne University information, and you can subscribe to that. I run courses in person and in Zoom. Um, yeah, I just really would love to you know, encourage anyone to get together with anyone who's doing good things and find find ways to celebrate and play and grieve together and learn together. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone have any last last thoughts or comments? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just the official thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes is uh, thanks again uh, Maya we can yeah if anyone would like to um, kind of connect with Maya please find her um, details um, we just put them on the screen and um, oh, where are we www.mayaward.com.au I do just need to say that it's um, yeah. pretty much in um, the creation at the moment I'm doing an overhaul and it's a complete dog's breakfast bit. What about your Facebook, Maya? Oh, even worse. But <laughs> don't let that dissuade you. If I'm, yeah, come along, sign up. One, you, I can send some, send you an email every now and then saying what I'm up to and what other good, good projects I know of and let people know and create a bit of a network of this kind of work. Mm. No, yeah, thank you. And thanks again to everyone who've, who's come. I've seen a few faces I haven't seen for a while. So it's really, really glad. And um, I, I must admit, I found the first writing experience was really powerful for me because it just brought back so many memories of, you know, 
of the gut spending time in a beautiful place when I was young. So, I, you know, there's a range of different things I can't unpack, but it's, yeah, so I was really grateful for that, Maya. So I appreciate it very much. Mm, thank you. Oh, yeah. And I, I am running over the next month or two a, a, a few different courses, some here in my home in Warburton and um, online by demand and so forth. So um, have a little look and, um, yeah, it'd be great to keep in contact. Brilliant. <laughs> no, no, thanks. Thanks, Maya. Yeah, so look, that would be um, good. And, and of course, uh, with um, Maya, as you do things in your home in Warburton, um, doing things on country when you actually get a chance to interact is also such a special way of kind of undertaking this work. So thank you. And um, I think we're, we're just about at time. I don't want to, you know, try to fill, but um, I mean, I know that you also do some stuff. Uh, you did a, like a, a pilgrimage, will you call it a pilgrimage, a yearly pilgrimage the other day uh, you know as as a community member something that i like to offer is you know annual walks up the mountains around here um so that's just you know a free event that me and a friend um organize just to to do something every year so it's been 10 years now of walking the mountains walking the mountains of home we call it so getting acquainted with the mountains i live in the most beautiful place it's a little village of warburton on the yarra river right on the river um, Birarang and um, there's the Yang Mountains on this side and the Yin on this, the rainforesty slope and I love, I tell everyone this, the words Yin and Yang in Chinese mean the shadow side, Yin, and the sun side of the mountains mm -hmm. and so those qualities came first from the land and when you walk here you really get a sense of the Yang qualities when you walk up the, the northern facing baking slope and then you can walk up the south facing rainforest slope and you have a completely different body experience. And it's a lovely chance for us to say thank you to this beautiful place and get people. Yeah, we've had the children, you know, pregnant mums and then on the backs and then now they're walking the, walking the whole way up by themselves and feeling very proud for having get, gotten to the top. It's, um, it's a project I'm very fond of. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Mayor. That's uh, good to hear about it. So, oh, look, thank you, Mayor, and for the workshop today and to everyone for joining us. Uh, please subscribe to our newsletter at the Contemplative Studies Centre to stay informed about this and other upcoming events that we're going to, that, can, that the Contemplative Studies Centre will be hosting. So we're looking forward to seeing you next time. So I hope everyone keeps well. Thank you again, Mayor. Thank you so much. Lovely to meet you all.